Siren Kierkegaard, Various Readings. The Philosophy of Religion on the Basis of Its History, Volume 2, by Otto Fliederer, 1887, pages 209 to 213. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anti-Rational View of Christianity. But it must be said that we cannot arrive at a clear and decided judgment of any form of Christianity which is not consistently worked out. Cofton's view appears to me to stop short of its legitimate conclusion, as he attributes value not only to the supreme good of the beyond, but also in a relative degree to the moral ends of this world, which stand in no necessary connection with the former. The full energy of the purely transcendental and therefore anti-rational view of Christianity we do not find in Kaftan, we find it in the Dane, Siren Kierkegaard. Note 1. One of his works is translated into German, viz. Exercises in Christianity, translated by A. Barthold, Holly, 1878, and gives a tolerably clear representation of Kierkegaard's original style of thought. I have also had at my disposal a number of papers by the Danish scholars, H. Brokner and S. Hegard, which Dr. Alexander Thorso of Copenhagen was good enough to translate for me. End of note. Siren Kierkegaard sets out like the Neo-Kantians from the position that truth is not a matter of objective thought at all, since such thought has for its contents some form or other of being and hence is quite inadequate for the existing, which is not a being, but a becoming. Christianity, in particular, is not a truth which could ever be the subject of scientific knowledge, whether called philosophical, or theological, or historical. It is rather a relation of existence, which can only be the subject of personal experience, of passionate, infinitely interested appropriation. The truth of it consists entirely in the subjective inwardness and passionateness of personal appropriation of and absorption in the absolute relation of existences on which salvation or its opposite depends. The way to Christianity accordingly does not lead through objective thought, which, so far as it is philosophical, is a delusion. So far as it is historical, can only attain to an approximation to the truth not to the truth itself. But equally little does the way to Christianity lead through the church, which, in its character as Christendom existing in alliance with the world, is rather a declension from true Christianity than the way to it. The way to it is no other than subjective thought, self-collection about one's own existence, infinite concern about oneself and one's sins, and the infinite passion of faith or of absorption arising from the deepest subjective interest in one's personal relation to the divine. But this way possesses several stages and leads through various forms of existence. The first stage is that of immediate or ascetic existence, where life is directed to enjoyment and consists in the passionate laying hold of the moment and of its fortuitous goods at each time, without any constancy of direction or any consciousness of the eternal value of the spirit. This stage leads to despair, which is finite, which, as finite, leads to hardening, but as absolute to submission and so to healing. The ego has to choose between its fortuitous individuality and its eternal spiritual validity. As it determines for the latter, it has gained itself in its freedom or absoluteness, and has passed therewith to the position of ethical existence. But the self which has attained its freedom can only maintain it by constantly realizing it. The ethical man is eo ipso, the acting man. The absolute freedom can only be realized as one with absolute dependence, for example, in the fulfillment of duty, especially of the man's calling, in which the universally human comes to individual expression. But the individual faints under the absolute demand of infinity, and comes to require higher assistance, and so the ethical is shown to be a mere transitional sphere on the way to the higher, the religious sphere. 
the first form of this existence not yet specifically christian is that of general religious inwardness or of absolute direction to the absolute end of eternal salvation but this absolute end does not admit of being reconciled with the relative ends of finiteness and so the man who directs himself to that end finds himself confronted with the task of renouncing his finite existence in its relative ends no longer having his life in them and in this pathos of self-renunciation accomplishing an act which transcends merely moral action the fundamental quality of the religious life is suffering to be without suffering is to be without religion but the meaning of suffering is self-effacement which however is not a spiritless giving up of ourself but the strenuous exertion of an uninterrupted struggle for self-mastery the relation of man to the eternal presents itself primarily as a consciousness of sin and guilt and out of this comes the specific christian religious spirit through the faith which lays hold of the paradox god manifested in time as man and looks for its salvation from its relation to the eternal who came into the limits of time to the divine which put on an individual existence it is the very essence of christian faith kierkegaard strongly insists that it conflicts with all the laws and forms of thought declaring the birth of the eternal in a particular moment of time and the union of god with an individual man in the historical god man but this very paradox which to thought is the inconceivable itself is all the more the highest certainly to faith faith lays hold of it afresh every moment with the infinite energy of a passionate desire of salvation and carries it off as it were in spite of the opposition of the understanding maintaining it on the strength of its own subjective feeling in spite of everything objective faith according to kierkegaard conflicts not merely with particular forms of thought but with thought itself and entirely it throws all the rational contents of consciousness overboard on principle and loses itself with its consciousness of sin in the paradox of the grace which appeared in time in the god man in this absolute miracle thus becoming contemporary with christ but this opposition contained in faith to what is naturally human is not limited to the intellectual side it affects the practical side as well as the miracle of faith can never be reconciled with reason the life of faith can never have anything in common with the life of the world as the need of salvation demands the breach with thought so it demands that a breach should be made with the finite interests of the world the absolute religious relation does not according to kierkegaard transcend the relative ethical relations of the life of the world in the sense that it embraces them in itself and seeks to develop its power in them and to elevate them to absolute divine worth and importance its relation to them is that of indifference exclusion negation it claims man's whole strength for itself requires him to refer himself absolutely to the absolute at every moment and sum up all his desires in a convulsive assertion of his entirely subjective relation to god to his eternal end to salvation then he has no strength left for ethical relations they must of necessity disappear as unessential and valueless in comparison to the infinite religious relation because they fall outside of it hence kierkegaard can only find true christianity in entire renunciation of the world in the following of christ in lowliness and suffering especially when met by hatred and persecution on the part of the world hence his passionate polemic against ecclesiastical christianity which he says has fallen away from christ by coming to a peaceful understanding with the world and conforming itself to the world's life true christianity on the contrary is a constant polemical pathos a battle against reason nature and the world its commandment is enmity with the world its way of life is the death of the naturally human not only was this negative relation characteristic of it at its first appearance this is still its abiding essence and hence so long as christianity remains true to its nature it can only call forth the most extreme opposition hatred and scorn on the part of the world
where this is not the case as in the christianity of the church it is a sign that true christianity is adulterated and perverted since it can never be the affair of the mass but only of the individuals who renounce the world in order to find god and to save their souls this is a consistent theory it teaches with a resolution worthy of tertullian not in theory only but in earnest contempt of reason and science of nature and of cultivation of the morals and customs of the world of marriage as well as others and of a church which conforms to the world and there is something refreshing something commanding in this resolute consistency when we contrast it with the half measures and ambiguities of our neo-kantian theologians it has also the advantage of being incapable of refutation since refutation can only take place by grounds of reason the validity of which is here denied in advance the position is therefore unassailable yet its trees will not grow till they reach heaven that is certain from the constitution of human nature the reason in which cannot be uprooted and was not abolished by christianity either so that abstinence from the use of reason in thought and action cannot be permanently epidemic End of recording. The Philosophy of Religion on the Basis of Its History, Volume 2, by Otto Fliederer, 1887, pages 209 to 213.